context of research and analysis to inform criminal and juvenile justice decision making. And we are comprised of a network of researchers and practitioners, which at the core include directors and staff from uh, the state statistical analysis centers. It is my pleasure today to welcome uh, you to our webinar on survival analysis, and it will be presented by Dan O'Connell, who is a senior scientist at the Center for Drug and Health Studies and is also an assistant professor of criminal justice at the University of Delaware. He is an expert in program evaluation, research on criminal careers, and the application of statistical methods to criminal justice issues. So welcome. Uh, before we go any further, I just want to uh, thank our partners at the Bureau of Justice Statistics for helping to make this webinar possible and also cover a few logistical items. So for those of you who have um, been uh, um, here um, watching our uh, uh, slides click along, you may have seen that uh, we do have uh, some upcoming webinars. Um, we do have one on May 3rd that is going to be by Matt Landon, uh, presented by uh, Matt Landon, who is at the Washington SAC. And then we also have another one, and you can actually register for that one right now, it's open. And then we do have another one that's on June 14th, and uh, that actually registration should be opening very soon. So uh, looking forward to those. And we do have um, additional webinars tentatively scheduled um, all the way through the summer. And so we will be um, posting those um, and opening registration uh, over the summer. So keep an eye out for those. Um, um, as uh, you may be familiar, you know, we are audio casting uh, this webinar through speakers and obviously via your computer. And you can, um, uh, you can, if you are having any audio problems, you can go to the menu bar at the top, click on audio, go to audio conference. And then it will either have a number that you can dial in and using your phone, or you can uh, use the speakers on your computer. If you have any audio issues throughout this session, you can just click on again, again click on that audio um, button, or you can follow the link that was given to you um, when you registered for the conference. So there's a couple options. If you still run into any issues, uh, you can contact Jason Trask at jtrask at jrsa.org, and he will um, try and help you. Um, this recording is being recorded, or sorry, <laughs> this session is being recorded, and it will be available in the next couple of days on our website. So um, if you'd like to review it or recommend it to some colleagues, uh, you will be able to find it in just a couple of days. Uh, we Let's see. Okay. Oh, yes. So if anybody has any questions, um, as usual, we do mute everybody on entry. So if you um, have questions, please use the chat um, feature that's at the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. And um, please remember to select host, presenter, and or panelists, so that will go out to everybody. Um, so, um, for example, uh, Jason Trask is the host. Um, so if you send a question, I actually won't see it or Dan won't see it. Um, and Dan, if you don't mind, uh, what one thing we could do is if people pop up with questions, um, I could just sort of um, politely interrupt and, and let you know what the question is, if that sounds good to you. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Let's see, and then helping us count. So we um, like to keep track of how many um, people are um, 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 calling in to, to attend our webinars. And so we do know that um, there are situations where people use one computer. So if, if you are um, one of those, excuse me, <clears throat> if you could just put in the chat feature your name of the person who registered and how many people are watching, that just, um, that just really helps us count and keep track of who's um, who's here, how many people are actually um, watching it um, actively. And then, let's see, did I cover everything? This session is scheduled for about one hour. We do have our poll at the end of the session, and that's just a few questions that, again, just gives us feedback and helps us keep track of how we're doing and what we can do to improve. So those are our two upcoming webinars. Again, the May 3rd is open for registration, and June 14th will be um, open soon. Okay, and so let me, um, I think that is it. That's all I have to say. So, Dan, I'm going to take the magic ball and pass it over to you. 
Well, thank you. I'm waiting <laughs> for the magic call to come. Uh, yeah, I'm Dan O'Connell. Like Aaron said, I'm a senior scientist at the Center for Drug and Health Studies. Uh, and they asked uh, me to put together a little something to walk people through an introduction to survival analysis. Uh, I, I want to focus on the key word up there, which is introduction. This is not a uh, high-end survival analysis. Matter of fact, mostly what I'm going to talk about is time and and, and how we think about time and, and how we analyze time. Uh, so with that, let's kind of move forward. So why are we here? We want to, we want to get an understanding of time. I want to talk a little bit about the data. Uh, and then I always say start simple. Um, survival analysis should be the last thing you do in your analysis. If you're doing time stuff, you should work your way up to it. Uh, and then we're going to talk about survival tables, uh, Captain Meyer plots, Cox regressions. Um, those are the two analytic techniques that uh, um, that we're going to discuss here uh, once we get to them. Um, so why? What is the big picture of this? We're often asked to uh, report on programs or initiatives or or uh, different things that are happening in criminal justice. Uh, we want to get the right answers to those questions so that we can inform policy. Uh, in, a, in, a, in a good way, and we want to do that in a way that we can present to uh, to general audiences. Um, so for this one in particular, um, we we want to move from a question to data to analysis to reporting. All right, so you should know what a survival analysis is good for. You should know a little about the required data parameters. You should know how to run a model. I'm going to be using SPSS for this, and I've got some screenshots for uh, for how to work your way through this. Uh, R will certainly do this. SAS will do this. Stata will do this. Um, and uh, but for today, I'm going to run us through the uh, the SPSS interpretations. Uh, I'm going to talk about how to interpret the output in these models. Uh, and then a little bit about how to explain the results to general audiences. Um, all right, so understanding time-dependent questions. Uh, not all questions are suitable for survival analysis. The key feature is always time. Uh, how long did it take for X to happen? Uh, X for us, actually I'll just use the example that I'm going to use, which is arrested for a new crime after a particular uh, date. Um, so does X happen at different times for different groups? In today's example, it'll be a, a treatment program that people were involved in. And so the question becomes, did X happen at different times for those two groups? Um, uh, so often we'll have not only did one group do better than the other in terms of the full time, but did people last longer, essentially? Uh, because when we're doing programming and we're, we're talking to policymakers, uh, one of the additional benefits of a change in policy or a change in a, a program is uh, not necessarily that everybody desists and goes out and uh, lives happy uh, lives, but if you can just prevent them from getting arrested uh, for an additional six months or, or whatever the time period is, that's another another way of showing uh, that, that something that you're doing is, is working. When we get to the uh, the Cox models, they're really good at predicting, uh, um, uh, well, the Kaplan-Meyer and the Cox models are how, predicting how long it takes for X to happen and what predicts that change uh, in length of time. All right, so uh, the example we're going to use today is data from a probation-based treatment program. Uh, and so the two questions are, are was the pro well, the uh, overlying question is was the program effective at reducing recidivism in this case rearrest uh, for a new crime and that's a zero one variable arrested or not um, was the recidivism rate different for groups and key for us is how long did it take them to fail uh, so we really want to focus in on a uh, on the time variables. There's 400 people in the sample, 200 in each group, and we'll be looking at some background characteristics on race, gender, age, and age at first arrest. Um, so it's all about the data. Uh, in this case, it's all about the dates. Uh, dates are, are very, very particular variables, very uh, problematic data. Uh, often they are, they are widely susceptible to data entry errors and field entry errors. Um, so you should really spend a lot of time making sure that your dates are correct uh, and understanding exactly what dates you should use. 
administrative databases, the type that SACs often work with. Um, you, 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 you'd be looking at perhaps, um, you know, let's just take a, a re-entry variable, like when somebody left, a date somebody left an institution, well, where did they go? Did they move from one institution to another? Did they move from an institution to a lower level institution? You have to figure out uh, exactly what the dates are, and usually what we want for these types of things is the date someone became at risk. Uh, so the date at which they, they, they went to the street. Often when you're doing survival analysis and things of these types, you're eventually going to need to get to the, the number of days until something, uh, which will have you taking like an arrest date and subtracting out the time at risk date, and often you'll get negative uh, numbers on that. These can be problematic and an indication that you need to go back and revisit your dates uh, and making sure that those days are all right. Uh, Generally, when I do this kind of analysis, the majority of time that we spent is not actually running the models. It's getting the date data correct. Because uh, if your date data isn't right, then anything that you do that follows from it uh, is not going to be right either. So uh, dates are very nice, but you can't really analyze them. So you have to take dates and move them to time. In this case, time counts. Uh, the number of days, we, you can use days, weeks, months, years, whatever. Generally, we use days. Um, so the number of days until something happens. In our example, uh, we're going to use a rest. So to figure this out, then, we need a number of dates. We need the start date, which is the date somebody became at risk. In the current study, it was the date uh, you, were, you were enrolled into the program, because this was a probation study. Um, so the date somebody, uh, basically the date they were randomized was what we used. But it, it could be any at-risk date, the date they got out of prison or jail. Um, but, but basically it's your start date. When does the clock start? Um, and then what we're looking at is the, the amount of time to the arrest date. So how many days did it take? So those are your two dates. The problem comes because everybody in most administrative databases and pretty much any database until you manipulate it. If somebody doesn't get arrested or experience whatever the event is, they don't have a date for that. Um, so we create an end date, which is the date the data collection ended or your cutoff date, uh, whatever that is. Uh, and we have to assign that date to a variable so that everybody has two valid dates. Otherwise, uh, the data go missing. And, uh, and and once the data go missing, obviously we can't analyze them. So the way we do this, uh, I'm going to fire up my little pointer here so I can highlight some things. Um, hopefully you see that little red dot. That's me. All right. So we want to combine the arrest date and the end date. So we, we assign an end date. Um, in, in this particular study, it was April 15th of 2013. That's the day the study ended in data collection uh, stop. So that would be essentially our right-hand sensor date, all right? So we have this first post-release uh, uh, date. That's the date of the first uh, post-release arrest, okay? So what we need to do then is create a new variable, which we're calling in this case all date, which is going to start with that first post date. And what we do then is if you're missing on that, meaning you didn't get arrested, we assign you that end date. So this new variable then has a combination of the arrest date and the end date such that everybody has a valid date. Um, and I will show you here how that, uh, how that works. Uh, well, I'll show you in a minute. Um, so once we do that, once we have this variable created, we can then go to SPSS, and we're going to want to compute the new variable. All right, so we're going to subtract the start date from the arrest date. So this is a basic compute statement in whatever software it is. In SPSS, it would be compute, date arithmetic, date difference. So it's a compute a new variable, and we go over to here, and we're looking for date arithmetic. And then we're, I don't know why date sum is highlighted. It should be date diff, that's the date difference. Um, and what we're doing is subtracting start date 
from end date, and we want the units to be days. Um, cool thing about SPSS, when you click on one of these, it'll give you a definition of exactly what it's doing there. Uh, or the, SIN, the SPSS syntax is right here for this compute time to arrest as a date diff. Um, so you can run it that way. R has its own. Uh, Stata has its own. These are these are fairly fairly simple procedures. Anyway, what that then gives us here's a screenshot of of what we just did. Okay, so we had start date, which is the date people became at risk. Then we had first post, which is the arrest date for everybody that was arrested. That's these folks here. But those people who were not arrested were missing on this. And what we did a couple of slides ago was then to, if you were, we created a new variable here, we called it all date. And if you were missing here, we assigned you the end date of the study. So everybody that was missing became 4, 15, 13, all right? And then, so then we have a variable where everybody has valid dates here, everybody has a valid date here, we then did that compute statement for a new variable moving from dates. These are all dates. This is a time, this is a count variable. This is number of days to arrest. And you see those people that didn't get arrested? Obviously, they had a lot of days. Um, and But now we've got a variable that we can analyze and nobody is missing on it. Um, so we take the next step. Uh, and I always say start simple. Uh, I tell this to my students all the time. They always want to rush in and jump right to the regression or the survival analysis. And I tell them, no, 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 start simple and work your way up. Um, it's kind of going back to your uh, your introductory stats class. I'll, you know, forgive me for that, but I feel like I need to drill this. Um, so we work up through frequencies, means, look for distributions and outliers. Then we move to bivariate stuff, and then finally to survival. So I'm very quickly going to show you how I do these when I'm dealing with time, and then we'll get on to the survival stuff, right? Frequencies, this is just getting to know you, getting to know your data. Um, for this one, you know, we had about 35% were arrested for a new crime during the study period, uh, which was about a year. Um, and then we go to the descriptives. Um, here's our time to arrest variable. Uh, the minimum, we had somebody who made it a, a whopping day, uh, and somebody made it about three years. Uh, that's actually an outlier that we reined in, uh, and our mean was 236. Um, so by doing this yourself, you're starting to get a feel for your data as you move towards um, your, your, your survival runs, which are coming later. All right. So when we uh, when we ask a question, when usually when you're examining a program or a change in policy, something that there's something that one group got and didn't, one group didn't get, um, that's a basic zero one variable. Uh, but for studies like this, anybody who's done recidivism studies knows you have to have time. Um, so when generally in this study, what we did was we segmented it out by days. We did 90 days, 180, 270, basically quarter years. Um, was our reporting. Uh, you know, the, the metric for a standard recidivism study is three years, where you'd be showing one year, two years, three years, the same rules apply here. Um, so what we want to do, so we want some SPSS or, or whatever you're using. We need to select people who were at risk on, for the, the amount of time. So in this case, I want to look at the number the, only at people who had 90 days at risk, right? So from our sample of 400, we're already dropping. We're down to 305, and we get our recidivism rate there. Um, and here's the temporary, you, you do a temporary command on this, make your select, and start walking through the time, right? And so we did that, and then we went to 180, 270. 365. So we're already modeling time, but we're modeling time at the bivariate, well, at, actually at the univariate level, we'll go to bivariate in a minute, right? A couple of things you see, as we go out in time, as we expect, the, recid the percent recidivating goes up uh, pretty high. So that 39% recidivism figure, uh, as people get higher out, uh, that number gets quite high as the sample shrinks, because in this case, 
uh, the study had an end date, so not everybody was in uh, at the end, which is a handy thing for survival analysis we'll talk about in a bit. Okay, what we really want to know is the effect of condition. Uh, so we move from those univariate to our bivariate. And this is the same thing. The important thing here is instead of just running a cross tab on everybody, we want to run cross tabs by time at risk. I'm not going to go through all of these. Um, so we're selecting out those who are at risk for 90. And then we did that. I don't have slides for this. I'm just showing you the one. Uh, and then we're looking at our condition variable, which was standard probation or treatment program. Uh, in this case, at 90 days, our, our, our treatment people were less likely to, to recidivate than our, uh, our uh, standard probation people. That's significant. Uh, and the reason I'm showing this again is that, is that you really do need to start simple and start working your way up to those survival functions, right? So then we go to our next bivariate test, which are T-tests, looking at now we're really starting to model time, okay? Um, so we're looking at days to arrest here. Um, so we're looking at um, the condition on that variable we created, which was time to arrest, which includes that cutoff date for everybody. And we're running a, just a simple t-test, and we're looking at the mean days to arrest by group. Um, so the standard group, they fell out. We're likely their mean arrest time was 184 days. Uh, the mean arrest time or end of study date uh, was 214 for the treatment folks. That's clearly significant down here. Um, so I stressed all that because, again, you should not start with survival analysis. So you run those types of things to get a picture for what's going on. And by the time you get here, you already know quite a bit. Um, so one question is, okay, if we know all this, why do a survival analysis? Uh, a couple regions, <laughs> visual plots are effective tools. When we get to these Kaplan-Meier curves, you look at one of these things, and especially if you've got it, well, even if you don't have a significant effect, um, but when you have a significant effect, you can show a policymaker uh, or, or, or a layperson, uh, and, 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 you know, one look at these charts, and you can really get the impact of something if it's working, or conversely, if it's not working, it's like, look, these lines are the same. Um, uh, but the main reason Cox regressions uh, especially allows us uh, to assess the impact of something like a program on time um, with something else. Cox regressions are funky because you really have two dependent variables. You have time and an event. I'll talk more about that later. But we can control for other variables while we're doing this. So as with any regression, you know, we did – we did our, uh, our, our univariate, our bivariate. Now we want to move up to the multivariate, and that's why we need these Cox regression models up here, which are coming up here in a minute. And importantly, um, all Kaplan-Meier and Cox survival analysis is, uses all of the data by modeling the censored data. All right? So people are censored. This came out of the, all this stuff came out of the medical field. Um, you know, whether you're doing studies on heart diseases and you're looking at the people, the percentage of people who died and survived uh, over long periods of time, but you, you very rarely follow them till the end of their lives. And so everybody is essentially censored. And that's true here, even doing a three-year recidivism study, we're censoring people at the end of the three-year window. Um, we know they didn't, they didn't die in three years. Uh, or they didn't recidivate in three years, but we don't know if they did, would have recidivated at all. Anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little off. But the sensor data is especially important for people who don't make it to the end of, of, of a time period, uh, like in our case where the, where, where the study data folks kind of fell out. It models using all of the data so that people don't go missing by modeling either the event or the sensor date, and I'll talk about that here in a little bit. All right, so survival analysis, it's basically a type of logistic regression. It's based on that, and it's used to analyze time to an event. Um, so why not use, um, I should say logistic or linear. Um, actually, there's two here. On the one hand, you can think about, if you think about our variable days to arrest, that is, uh, it's not really a scale variable, uh, although it, it's tempting to treat it like one because we had the minimum of one 
and the maximum of about a thousand and all of the units in between there. Um, so in some ways, uh, that could be, some people would want to model that uh, in, in a maximum likelihood model. But that doesn't really work um, because A, there are no negative values here and regressions assume that the negative value could at least exist uh, and everybody is censored. Um, and so the data are not truly continuous because uh, everybody in the model is censored uh, at some point. This violates our assumptions of normality, which makes it useful then to use a logistic uh, technique on the hazard and the survival functions. Um, so that's basically why we're doing it. Uh, why survival analysis accounts for all this by determining the likelihood of surviving at each unit step. That's the survival function. So for each unit step, um, it, 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 it models whether the person survives or fails uh, and, and, and then puts that into the analysis, which we see. Um, now, for most users in criminal justice, uh, there's only a couple things in survival analysis that, that, that are going to be of interest. Uh, the medical folks like to use the life tables, which can be produced, uh, but uh, we don't really get into those too much. What we want here are the Kaplan-Meier graphs and the Cox regression coefficients. So, we're going to take a look here at the Kaplan-Meier techniques and then at the uh, Cox regression techniques. So, Kaplan-Meiers are uh, basically a way of running a survival curve. It's, it's sort of a bivariate thing. Uh, and it, what it does is it, it gives us a survival function on, well, you could do one group, but generally on two groups uh, is what we're doing. So, in SPSS, the way you would run this, if you're doing it in the, in the Windows version, you would go to Analyze. That'll get you the drop-down menu. We're coming over to Survival, and then we are selecting out Kaplan-Meier. All right, so Analyze, Survival, Kaplan-Meier. And then if we go to the next slide, okay, so that will get, that gets you this window here. And when that window pops up, we're looking to put in a, a few things. We want the measure of time. In our case, that's the time to arrest variable that has a, that has a value for everyone, the one we created. We want the outcome event. That's our status, and that is a new crime. When you put this in here, it'll make you click this here, the define event, and it basically just wants to know the unit that defines the event. For us, it's a zero, one variable, and uh, so we want that one. And then the factor, or is the comparison variable, that's our treatment variable, it's condition in this study. So if we load those three things in and hit OK, it'll run. Uh, I always tell people it's really good to, to get your, your, your code down so you can either write your code um, or I tell people, if you, even if you're doing the Windows-based technique for this stuff, uh, if you click paste, this will click and put it into a, uh, it'll produce basically this in a syntax window, which is really handy uh, because then you can go back later and see exactly what you did. Uh, also makes it easier to start tweaking things. Um, so anyway, whether you do this or click OK, uh, that will run the model and you will see this. This is a Kaplan-Meier survival plot. Uh, when we talk about survival analysis, this is generally what people are, are, are looking for. Uh, and these are a powerful tool for talking about data, all right? So survival plots, then, it's a graphic representation of the time to failure. So here's time on the bottom going out, and here's the cumulative survival. So in the beginning, everyone has, is surviving on, on day one. All right, and then we see people start to drop off, and, and they follow different curves. I'll talk about that in a minute. Again, this is utilizing all of the data uh, for everyone. Bivary analysis presented earlier, if you remember those shrinking samples we had. This one, when you use a Kaplan-Meier, it uses as much data as you have, uh, and, and you look here, the little T's are when somebody is censored. So that means the clock ran out on them. Okay, so you have two things going on. You have the, uh, the, the, the people failing out by getting arrested, and then you have the people who are, uh, who are dropping out because they've been time censored. But either way, it uses 
each case for as long as the case is valid until one of two things happen. The person fails or is arrested or is censored by time, uh, the end of the study period, and has not failed. Um, so going to the, going to the plot, uh, it's pretty easy to see. You know, we have the two groups here. The blue is the standard probation and the green is the treatment. And basically what we see here uh, is that the standard probation group starts failing and falling off pretty rapidly, right? Uh, and not only does the treatment group do better, but the shape of the curve was interesting. So it's telling us some things that we wouldn't know just from looking at other things. We see an initial drop off. Um, not as fast as the probation, but, you know, going down. And then there was a plateau effect uh, where people stabilized for a while and then that fell apart, all right? So being able to analyze this, somebody can go back to the program or whatever it is and try to determine what's happening, okay? So at a certain point, people got stable. At a certain point, they started dropping out. Um, so those are those are types of things that visual representations can be pretty useful for, uh, and one of the things we get out of doing these type of survival things. Okay, uh, along yes. with yes, yeah. I actually, could you go back? I have a quick question. I just wanted to clarify something. I, I don't know if anybody else might have this. I just wanted to. So you're talking about the 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 people. Those little crosses represent people who have been censored. So I'm assuming that's people who. Let's say they, you know, were released very close to the end of the project date, but they were included in the project. So they have, once that date ended and they were censored, they're kind of, they just have a smaller time frame. So they didn't recidivate, but they have a small um, number of days. Does that make sense? Is that what those crosses mean? Yeah, yeah. So the crosses, you have two things happening. And it's hard to see in this one. It's a little dirty. <laughs> Uh, partly because there's a lot of cases in here. So you have the censoring people and then the drop people. So you have the two things happening at once. Um, so following the shape of the curves then, yeah, you're, you, you are correct. So you've got okay. the censored and the steps. So like here are the okay. steps and people are stepping and getting censored. Okay. Uh, making you. sense? Yep. yep. So, and, and that actually leads in well here because when we get into the, uh, when we get into the, uh, the, the, the tables that come with the output as well, you get the uh, percentage of people that survived, right? So 39, these are the events, that's the number of people arrested, right? So in the control group, we had 133 people arrested. In the standard uh, probation group, we had 39 people arrested. Uh, and because in this one, uh, there weren't as many people arrested, almost 80% of the sample was censored because they didn't get arrested. So if you don't get arrested, eventually you get censored, okay? Whereas in the standard probation group, where there was a higher number of people getting arrested, uh, fewer people were censored, right? So this basically tells you that 80% of the people ran out the clock uh, in one way, shape, or form in the treatment program, whereas 48% ran out the clock uh, in the uh, in, in, in the standard probation. Um, so there is a lot of useful information in here. Now, if we jump down to the means and medians for survival time, we get more information, uh, basically looking at the estimates and then the, uh, the confidence intervals. Um, and you get the median survival time and the mean survival time by group. Um, so just to take the mean here, we get like, there's the overall mean, 291. Uh, the treatment mean was higher, and the standard probation mean uh, then, then was even higher, right? And then we get the 95%, we get the confidence interval bounds around those. Um, so there's a lot that you get out of this table. Um, but again, this is basically bivariate stuff. It's bivariate on an outcome. Uh, but what it's doing is modeling time uh, in, 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 in a pretty unique way, um, both graphically and data-wise. And, and because of the estimators that it's using, uh, it's able to take, it, take advantage of all of the data, which uh, the, the techniques we looked at earlier in the presentation were not doing. Um, so that's Kaplan-Meier uh, stuff.
Okay, so that's that. That's the first level. Generally, when I do this kind of stuff, I'm, I, I do it in exactly the order that I'm presenting it. I start with the data, start playing with the dates and getting all of that right, move up through my simple frequencies, cross tabs, and t-tests. Then I move into my Kaplan-Meier tables and start working with this stuff. And then finally, at long last, we get to our Cox regression models, which in many ways are the meat of survival analysis. This is like if you were doing – uh, if you were doing regression models, you would do the same thing, and the last thing you would do is run your regression models. It's the same here, except we're modeling time. Um, Cox regressions are an extension of logistic regression. Uh, as you'll see when we get to the output, it's, it's essentially a logistic regression output, uh, and it allows the estimation of time to failure in multivariate models. Um, so what they do is they take – basically, they take this stuff, and do it in a multivariate and allows multiple predictors. So we can test the impact of X, whatever variable it is, on survival time while controlling uh, for other variables. Uh, and of course, it allows for full model significance tests. So how do we run a Cox uh, regression? It's kind of the same as, as, as the, uh, the Kaplan-Meier. As a matter of fact, you start in the same place, analyze. Go to survival, gives you the drop down, except instead of selecting Kaplan Meyer, uh, we're selecting uh, Cox regressions. You can use Cox with time dependent variables. That does not come under the introduction to survival analysis, so we're not going to talk about that today. Um, but it's basically just a, a different step. Um, so, that, if you go through that, it will bring you to this, um, which is where you set up the SPSS model. Much like uh, setting up a Kaplan-Meier, uh, these two, in fact, are the same. Uh, so we have our time variable. Again, we're using time to arrest. We're using new crime. But because it's not a bivariate, because it's a multivariate, in this block, we can enter multiple variables. And here we're entering condition, uh, start age. This is a control factor for age at first Delaware arrest. Um, which is a criminal justice uh, control variable, which ended up not ma ma making much difference in this one. Anyway, what you can't see down here is we have race and gender in the model as well. Uh, we're not using strata here. Uh, on the methods, you can do uh, you can do some stepwise things here. You can select for this example. We're going to enter everything, and we're going to enter it all in one block. Uh, if you want to get fancy, you can often you'll enter things one at a time. So we could do block one, enter condition, block two, you would click here, and then you know build your model up over over blocks. Um, and it will it will test the, the significance of those blocks as you go forward. But in in interest of keeping things simple, uh, we're just we're just going to do a full enter model here. Uh, and again, if you click paste or write the code yourself, you'll get this. Uh, if you click OK, it will just run the model. Um, and so, so the first thing we get are the full model test results. We want to know if our model even fits the data. Um, generally, they do, I guess, um, but, you know, we want to we want to run this test. So the way this works, it's a, it's a negative two log likelihood model. Uh, as you see in, in, in some other methods, we use these types of things. Um, there's no real interpretation by itself of a negative two log likelihood statistic, except that smaller is better. The key is that you can look at the difference between two model estimates. So model one and model two, you can look at the change in the log likelihood, which follows a uh, chi-squared distribution. So we have our model, what it does when you run it in SPSS or any other program, uh, it, it runs the model with no predictors, essentially. It gives you a log likelihood for that. And then the model with the uh, all of the predictors in it, and it gives you a second log likelihood for that, right? And essentially, the difference between those two is a chi-squared statistic. So the difference between the two, uh, you have the overall, the change from the previous, this is actually the one that's modeling, is the change from the previous step, uh, and that's 55. The typo it should be 59.937, and of course, in a chi-square distribution, that's significant, no problem. All right. So we know our model is significant. We know it's a valid model, um, and therefore, we can go to the next step and, and look at, uh, at at what it's showing us. Uh, these are the individual variable tables. 
These are saying, if you look, if you just jump down here and look at this thing, if you're used to uh, logistic regressions, this is going to be a very, very familiar table because that's what it is. Um, except the exponential beta is the probability of experiencing an event throughout the observation period. This is the hazard ratio as opposed to an odds ratio. So it's an exponential beta uh, referred to as a hazard ratio, right? So what's that mean? Uh, an exponential beta here, a hazard ratio above one means that for a one unit increase in X, there is a corresponding you know, increase in the probability of Y occurring. All right, so for us, I pick a positive one, even though it's not significant from our data. Being male is associated, it increases the probability of being arrested by 1.48 times. That is this, all right? So that's a positive exponentiated beta, okay? For our condition variable, which is really the variable, and that's holding everything else constant here. Um, in this one, the only really thing that jumped out was the program variable condition. It was negative. Um, for our condition variable, which was 0 0.405, so less than one, so it's negative, we would say that the odds of someone in the program not surviving, not getting arrested, are 405, um, what they are for those not in the program controlling for other variables. I have always found this language incredibly confusing, uh, and in the literature and, and just in general, people disagree on how to interpret what is the best interpretation of these negative exponentially aided betas. And so I do what I always do. I take the inverse. Uh, if you want to flip a negative uh, logistic coefficient, you just take one, divide it by your coefficient, and that may, gives you a positive, in this case, 2.4. So then the language becomes the odds of someone in the program surviving, not getting arrested, or 2.4 times the odds of someone not in the program controlling for other variables. So that is essentially it. Um, so we move from uh, basic, very simple things, modeling time, um, getting our date straight upset, getting a count of the, nut, the length of time it takes for something to happen, then moving, I'm going to jump through the slides here real quick and probably confuse you all. Moving to these Kaplan-Meier models where we have our survival functions, um, where it starts to get fun. These are kind of our bivariate models. Uh, of time, then moving to the Cox regression models and ending here um, with, uh, with, 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 with our, uh, <clears throat> our output from the Cox regression, all right? So somebody asks, and somebody does ask, uh, why didn't we just use a logistic regression on the zero one, whether people failed or not? Um, because we would have had a lot of missing data, for one thing. Uh, the main reason then is that survival analysis with Cox regression, it utilizes all of the data uh, by, by modeling uh, at that censored endpoint. Uh, every piece of data in the, that, that we have collected gets utilized, right? In our data, the endpoint was the end of the study, uh, but even the best administrative data has an endpoint. Uh, that's today, if nothing else. If we're looking at people, uh, that, you know, we're doing a study and today is April 26, 2018, those people are all censored as of today. Uh, we don't know whether they're going to recidivate tomorrow. All we can say is that they haven't recidivated. Um, and that's all time-dependent data are essentially censored. Uh, and survival analysis accounts for this. It allows us to deal with this uh, and, and to make a more robust and a more confident uh, statement about what's going on um, with our data. Um, so that's basically it. So we're kind of at the end. Uh, people are often asked to provide reports on issues that involve time-dependent variables. People want to know how long it takes for something to happen and what predicts uh, how long it takes for something to happen. That's where these things come in. Uh, and survival techniques provide relatively simple ways of doing answering these questions. I think these models are fairly straightforward. I think that, you know, the trick is in the data on this stuff. As I said in the beginning, 
date variables are very, very particular. Every time I do these types of analysis, the vast majority of the time we spend is on getting the date variables correct. Uh, once you've got them, the data and the analyses are fairly straightforward. Once you've got that, uh, I echo this every time I do a presentation or in a class, I say start simple, work your way up, uh, don't jump right into the survivals. Um, and the other one I always conclude with is remember, you're not alone. Uh, do try this at home. If you've got some data, uh, pull up SPSS or Stata uh, and just start playing around with some stuff. Your colleagues are your best resource. Go down the hall, talk to somebody at your agency, um, use your resources. Uh, we live in an age of researcher practitioner relationships. If you're at a SAC and you've got a local university, call those folks up. Um, if you're at a university and you've got a SAC, call your SAC because they've got the data. Um, and often they're looking for new ways to analyze it. Uh, more and more you can get questions answered on Google. There are forums everywhere where you can go ask statistical questions um, and, and, and get answers to them. There's tutorials, there's house too. Um, and reach out to people by uh, via email. Um, and that's about it. Looks like we have a question from Ryan. Yeah. Uh, I'm interested to know a little bit more about the consideration of censored data within these models. Does the regression weight cases by length of time in the study, or does it just not omit cases uh, if they are censored before the? It does not. It doesn't weight them. Um, it, it gets a little funky in this. Uh, it, it basically it's not omitting them uh, for the sensor. So it, it, it models, it's modeling two things at once. It's modeling either time to failure or time to sensor. Uh, and, and the underneath of that uh, gets, gets a little technical. Um, and frankly, I, I don't even always understand that. I've got to look it up. Um, that's a bad answer to that question. Um, but, uh, but what it is doing is dealing with that right-hand censoring in the algorithm that it's running. Uh, and, uh, yeah, to get into that is probably a little bit more advanced than today. That's a great question. Um, I have an, a question. Oops, um, Dan, another person Let me um, that you might not see. Let me see. I accidentally just got rid of it. Um, okay, here we go. Um, Okay, so here's another question for you. Do you subtract one from date diff um, arithmetic so that those released and arranged next day are one and those released and arrested same day are zero? Let me know if you want me to repeat that. No, I got it. I got it. I got it. Um, in this one, we didn't have to because we didn't have that. But, yes, you can subtract one. Uh, or add one conversely, uh, so that you don't have any zeros in there. You probably don't want any zeros in your time. You want everybody to be a positive. So, so adding adding one uh, or subtracting one, depending, uh, would, would would be valid. Um, I've never actually had that happen. Um, but yeah, so yeah, if you, if you got a zero in there because zeros in these things, what would it do with the zero? That would be kind of fun. Um, And I think yeah. So when you, yeah, when you, huh? Go ahead. Oh no, I'm sorry. Keep sorry. Keep um, explaining. But I just want to bring your attention. I there's another question when you're done that you might be able to see as well. Sorry. Oh, okay. Uh, well, on the other one, I've never actually run into a case where I had a zero when I did the data arithmetic. Um, so I'm not quite sure. What you, yeah, I, my hunch is you, my hunch is you would actually you would either add one to 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 to, to the days um, once you got it if you had a zero to avoid that problem, or you could add one um, to 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 the arrest date uh, to to avoid that. I think, I think that's right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, are there any implications for modeling recidivism with a survival model? Seeing as how the assumption here is not that everyone will eventually recidivate as in a traditional clinical use of survival. Now, assuming everyone will die, uh, does this affect our interpretation of, uh, have you ever had to justify this? Well, I've never done it on a straight recidivism study. I've always done them on, uh, on survival studies where the study, where the study ended. 
Um, so we had an end date and people were getting, were, were ending there. So it wasn't necessarily a death, but for everybody in the model, uh, the thing ended. Uh, I guess you could consider a recidivism study the same way, because if I'm doing a three-year recidivism study, essentially that three-year window is my right-hand sensor, and it's not that everybody dies at the end of year three, uh, but the clock runs out on them. Um, I've never, so no, I've never had to, had to explain that, but I assume, um, I assume that right-hand sensor on a recidivism study would be the same as it is. So we make the assumption not that everybody dies, but but that the clock runs out and then so everybody gets censored. I'm not sure if that made sense, but if I, if I interpreted your question right. Great. Um, I'm going to, um, let's uh, wait a couple minutes to see if anybody, oh, Justin has got it, thanks. Um, as a and, hey, Justin or anybody else, if you want to email me, we can, we can talk yeah. more about this actually. Um, We're going to launch the um, poll while everybody's still on. Jason, if you could uh, launch the poll, um, that would be great. And then um, we can see if anybody has any additional questions. Great. I take it I'm not supposed to fill out the poll. <laughs> no, sorry. No, no, that's okay. It was just kind of funny that it didn't pop up. But, you would know. be like, this he's wonderful. Um, well, we, well, actually, I was thinking I confused myself. But, so. <laughs> <laughs> so here's a question. I know that you usually use SPSS, but are you aware of, uh, like, are there pros and cons to using it in – the Kaplan-Meier or Cox regression in um, SCADA, or do you know of anybody else in the field that has preferences that's not just, I know that some people like STATA, some people like SPSS, but are there any differences in how it's run or analyzed in those systems? I, I, don't, I don't know that there are differences, uh, but uh, I know like the guy down the hall from me, like literally three doors down the hall from where I work, runs these things in STATA. Uh, and, and he and I go back and forth with output all the time, uh, and the, the output is essentially the same. Uh, essentially, I mean, the, 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 key, the key components are there. Each one gives you some, some different things that, um, that I haven't looked at his data ones because he'll come down the hall and show me, show me some plots and, and some tables, and I can interpret those. Um, you know, my, my hunch is the algorithms are, 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 are pretty much the same. Uh, what would be, the, you know, and, and with, with all of these things, you know, people work in the program, they, they, they're most familiar with generally. Um, mm -hmm. But I don't think it really matters which one you use. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Great. So while we are just wrapping up, um, I just want to, again, thank Dan for hosting and leading this webinar today. Um, if you have any questions, you can um, reach out to him via email. And um, I would like everyone to thank everyone for attending today. We do have two upcoming webinars, as I had mentioned earlier. just want to um, advertise those again as we're wrapping up. We have one on um, May 3rd, which is next week. So um, that one registration is available and open. And then there is one scheduled for June 14th, and that one should be um, uh, available soon. So keep your eyes open. And I guess uh, if we have no additional questions, I just uh, want to thank everyone for joining us today. And have a good afternoon. Thanks. Great. Thank you.